And now, okay. there we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Why Our World interview series. And in this series of interviews, we are talking to our users all over the world and getting their experiences and their perceptions and their interactions uh, with the R world and the R community and the R language and discussing it as a career path. Today I'm joined by Gina Griffin. Hi Gina. Hi. Uh, Gina is joining us from Florida, is that correct? That is correct. So Gina, just say a little bit of an introduction to yourself. What's your background or what are you, where are you working at uh, and what's your connection with R so right now? <laughs> Uh, my career is a social worker. I'm a social worker and a trauma therapist. I work with veterans who have combat and military sexual trauma. So I spend my day doing therapy with people and helping them to get better. Um, I am also a doctor of social work student. I'm almost done. And my area tends to be uh, social work and technology. So I'm th that is a whole different subject, but um, I, I really enjoy finding ways to integrate uh, technology into social work practice. That's a very interesting subject area. So uh, we'll, we'll just sort of take this in stages first off. So uh, your early career is all based on social work and not really uh, statistics or data scientists, which is the background of a lot of people in the art community. You're very much in a different field to many people watching this video. So just give us a bit of background there. Social work is actually my second career. I had a whole different career that I did for 25 years or so. And it was a technical career. It was a creative career. So I feel very comfortable with technology. I feel very comfortable with computers. Um, a lot of those jobs that, you, that you're in, you wind up doing kind of everything. So whatever it is that you yeah. think you're doing, that's not going to be all. So you're also doing help desk and solving problems and you know, using programs that you never wanted to use like PowerPoint and teaching other people how to use them. So I did that for a really long time. And then I realized at some point that what I was actually doing was, um, being in a locked room doing secure work with engineers overnight and listening to their problems. So I changed paths in the middle of a, a college degree that I was working on and became a social worker because I thought I wanted to be a psychologist and everybody said, yeah, no, you were totally a social worker. You're all about social justice and dignity and respect of people and self-determination. You were totally a social worker. So that is how that happened. And uh, as a a uh, quick remark, uh, or sorry, that's a that that, that is actually uh, there's a lot of actually like uh, sort of statistics and data analytics involved in that uh, line of work. Actually, I know that because I have some sort of similar background in that. Uh, just actually tell me, uh, like, how what's your experience of bringing data and statistics into those that skill set? Where is the intersection there with social work? From your point I... of view, at least. I think experience. I'm a little unusual, but I'm, I'm becoming less unusual. There's a lot of writing about the fact that social workers hate statistics and data analysis and technology. And I'm hoping that that's starting to change. There are a lot of us who, um, especially if you follow the hashtag SW Tech on Twitter, who are really interested in bringing more technology into social work practice and education. Um, and so there, I, I see lots of opportunities for it, and that tends to be what I write about at this point in my career, and the direction that I've um, focused my capstone project on. So there are lots of opportunities to use statistics and data analysis. For example, um, if you're something like a case manager, um, HUDVASH is a very popular, very successful housing program um, that helps veterans to get housed. If you're a case manager and you manage a fleet of social workers and their vehicles, at some point you're going to have to account for all of the things they do in those vehicles, like how much gasoline and how much mileage and how many patients they've visited over the past week and the past month. And what's their productivity and how many RVUs do they have, which is what, how, um, how much do they actually work and have face-to-face -face time with patients and all of those things that are all of those are things that you can take out of a spreadsheet and uh, use in statistical software or use uh, with a coding language like R um, and then also there's something we do called measurement based care 
which um, helps us to use psychological me measures uh, for things like how do you measure how much trauma symptomology somebody's experienced over the past month or what is your level of depression and we collect those things over time and they're very helpful in helping us to conceptualize is the patient getting better but you can also look at those things collectively and see how well is your clinic doing how many patients have you served uh, what does the trend look like and if the trend is going down you're doing something wrong so maybe Maybe you need to use different evidence-based uh, treatments. If you're doing something right, then what is it that you're doing right so that you can do that better? And then all of that translates into things like research and program evaluation. So I think all of those things are things that social workers can and should be using. And hopefully I can make that a little bit easier for them to do. That's a really interesting subject. And I, I get the sense that this is a very new field, that the social work is, the social work field is, this is sort of new to them, but hopefully it's the beginning of a, a, a really, a, a, a whole new paradigm. Would that be fair to say? It is, but it's not. I think it's just a lot of the stuff that I've been writing about in my capstone is the, and I am not the only one. This is not new for me. Um, I just really dig it. And I've been reading about it for two years. So that's all I've done. Um, but a lot of it is really the problem of bringing academia and practice together so people who work in academia think this way and they work this way all the time and the tools are familiar to them and it would totally make sense to them to measure what those outcomes look like with patients. If you're a practitioner and you're doing face-to-face -face work, then you probably don't have time to do those things. You probably don't have support for management. They're not going to train you because they might not really see the value of doing that, which is a shame because it's super helpful because why are you doing all these things with patients if it's not successful? And the way that you know it's successful is if you measure it. Um, so I don't think it's new. I think it's just a problem that we've, that we've been working on for a long time. And I think a lot of us are really working a lot harder now to bring those two okay. areas together. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it does actually. Uh, just my uh, something I worked on myself in, uh, as a, a, a support and a support basis as a programmer was a longitudinal survey in Ireland called the Growing Up in Ireland Survey, which is a life course survey of uh, children in Ireland and sort of like tens of thousands of children around seeing how they progress. So, mm -hmm. the, and it was actually, it was quite, I did actually use R quite a lot in it. Uh, just actually, uh, I just wondered like, can you describe to everyone like a little bit more about those type of surveys and that type of analysis? I realize it's tangential to what you do, but it's, I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, would really fit in well there. The types of things that I, I will speak for myself, the types of things that I would use on a on a daily basis are psychological measures. Um, they are standard. They have face validity. They, um, they've been uh, measured over and over again over time. So we know that they do what we think they do. They measure what we think they measure. So that's why we use them. So there are things like the PCL5, which measures um, the effect of trauma symptomology over a week or a month or a specific amount of time. Um, PHQ-9, uh, and there are a couple of versions of that. There's a three question measure and a five question measure, I think. I usually use the nine question measure. Um, and that looks at what um, depression has looked like for a patient over, two week, over a two week period. Uh, there are all types, um, some that I don't do. There are some that kind of exist in the world of psychology. I have colleagues who do those like the MMPI and that's fairly sophisticated and it can measure a great many things. It won't tell you what a diagnosis is, but it will point you in the direction of a diagnosis. Um, but all of these things, are, they have data attached to them. They are numbers. They are quantifiable as numbers. So if you can pull that data out, then it'll probably tell you something over time. Excellent. Uh, just like as you sort of described, you had a like a, a career that sort of uh, put you in contact with a lot of practical technical skills, like you just said, PowerPoint and spreadsheets. What was your background? Where was your first introduction to R? And how did you find your, like, uh, your first R for the first time? How did you discover it? And what was your early journey like? I was still a relatively new social worker. 
and I was working in a really good unit that worked with people who had military sexual trauma. It was a really unique population of people and I desperately wanted to do research. And then there were all of these stumbling blocks that kind of got in the way of doing my research. There were a lot of people who were doing gatekeeping and it just, it was very difficult for me to do that. I think initially it was because I was, um, I was early career and it would have required a mentor to do that and nobody was stepping up to do that. Uh, but I was there for a long time and then eventually the stories became things like, uh, no, it's not the right time and your productivity needs to be higher before you do this. And it's really a shame because there weren't a lot of people in that position who wanted to do research. And I feel that there were some things that were lost because we weren't measuring them from that perspective. So I got the idea that if I could learn how to work with statistics better, and if I could do data analysis, then maybe I could hop on other people's projects. And I, I was looking for free programs because we had an SPSS license in the hospital, which of course I couldn't use at home and it was expensive. And I think at some point we didn't even have a license anymore. So I thought I would teach myself R. And then I stumbled onto some things online like, um, not so standard deviations and some other things. And through them, I found uh, the USAR conference. So I wound up getting a USAR diversity scholarship super early on. And I went that year they were at Stanford. I think that was like maybe 2017, 2016 or 2017. 16, I think, yeah. yeah, and that was super amazing because I got to meet all these people and learn probably a lot more about R than I would have online just by having being a social worker and sitting at people's tables and going, so, hey, what do you do with R? So wow. um, I tell people I came for the programming language, but I stayed for the community because the community was just amazing. Good stuff. Uh, just actually sort of uh, uh, tell us more about your your early pers or your perspectives on that. So like, uh, just actually like to tell us about the diversity scholarship, actually, just to sort of a uh, quick, for people who are not familiar with use R even, uh, yeah. what the diversity scholarship was. The Diversity Scholarship is a super great program that's offered through our, our studio, our consortium. I can't keep everything straight. But if you um, are sort of an outlier in the R community, if you are a person of color, if you are a woman, if you are LGBTQ, if you have a disability, you're probably not super represented in the R community or in the technical community. So they have created a program so that we can balance those scales a little bit and get um, at least make the, con the conferences look a little bit more representational in those areas. So you submit an application, you tell them what you have been doing in the art community, why you feel um, you have something to offer, maybe show them some of the things that you've been working on. And if you are lucky enough to be a recipient, then uh, you, you're way to the conference will be paid and it's pretty much everything which is really nice so hotel room airfare um your admission to the conference obviously um generally in conjunction with that it, it can be helpful it's not required because clearly i didn't do that the first year because i had no idea what i was doing but it's helpful if you can do some sort of a talk as well so if you're doing a poster or a lightning talk um that's a good opportunity to uh to learn how to do that or do that for the first time. So it's a great program. And if you haven't done that, you absolutely should apply the next time you have a chance. And that's coming up soon because there's another Use Our conference coming up this year. That's correct. It'll be, this is a, this is recording is in March, 2021, 20 and uh, it will be online this year. And hopefully many people around the world will participate. Uh, hopefully there we, we will have uh, in-person conferences again in the future. Uh, so just actually like what are sort of practical things, uh, what sort of supports did you have? Like, I mean, you weren't learning R as part of a college program or night classes. You, you were doing it all yourself, weren't you? Yeah, I was my own support. Um, there were there were some local groups at the time. I think I had a hard time getting to them. The, the closest group was on the other side of Tampa Bay. So I really had a difficult time getting there. I'm now at a hospital that's closer to them. And that's the Tampa R users group. And they are super. They're a really great, smart bunch of people. Uh, a lot of them are career researchers, work at some of the local hospitals, some of the cancer centers, and they do some very cool things. Um, I, I, I do not think I'm a slouch, but when I go to those meetings, I, I don't feel as smart as they are. Those are like, they're, they're so good at statistics and data analysis and data science. And that is an excellent group to go to. 
there was not an Our Ladies group yet. Um, I heard about Our Ladies at the Use Our Conference, and uh, I, I, I screwed up the courage to start the Our Ladies group in Tampa. Right now, it's on hiatus because I'm trying to graduate one of these yeah. days. But what I have found is that over time, we, we have our own sort of niche. So Tampa, our users group is a lot more for people who have experience and who are very well versed in what they're doing. And Our Ladies tends to be a lot better if you were in the introductory phase. So people tend to come to us if they're still even just learning how to get the software installed on the computer. I think like uh, yeah. having supports like that is invaluable to a lot of people because I think a lot of people would sort of fit into that second secondary category that they you know they, they just uh, need uh, supports to help them get started and on ramp and stuff like that. So I think that that sort of is so valuable and such a great resource to the community. And uh, just actually sort of like in terms of our packages now, you, this is very interesting sort of work. You, you uh, that uh, are there's thousands of our packages, but what sort of packages would align specifically with your line of work? I have no idea because I don't know anybody else who's doing this. But what okay, I did, is, <laughs> I did get them to install it on my computer at work, which is amazing. Um, of course, I'm kind of I'm, I am a tidyverse girl. I was mad because nobody told me about tidyverse for like the first two years. And so there are people I'm still not talking to because they were letting me struggle with Basar. <laughs> I tend to teach um, Tidyverse. And of course, I have that technical creative background. So I'm all about ggplot2. Uh, I think that I promise the next time that we have um, uh, an online class for social workers that we're going to do gganimate. So I'll probably do the same thing for Our Ladies Tampa. So I, I tend to stick in the area of um, data visualization. I feel very comfortable there. So that leads me on to my next question there. You actually uh, uh, do uh, you provide classes and stuff like that for social workers uh, and bringing them into the tech world and our community and so on. Tell us more about that, actually. Yeah, so my capstone project is a website called Adventures in Social Work Research, which is a little goofy, but nobody's called me on it yet. So using it. Um, the idea is that it will help direct practice social workers to be able to develop the skills that they need to do research and, of course, program evaluation and integrate those skills into their skill set. Um, my goal is to always offer it for free. So I'm looking for funding. I'm learning how to say that out loud comfortably because you never know who's listening um, so that we can scale up the site and add a lot more modules. The, the part that I focused on to finish my capstone is the data science part because I had so much experience with our ladies. So I was actually sitting, I think, in a use our, I, I was doing a Zoom, a, a Zoom meeting. And it occurred to me that if I could do that with our ladies and if R could do that with the rest of us, then why couldn't I do that for social workers? So at some point over the summer last year, I started offering uh, courses for well, not really courses, but I started offering classes online for free for social workers who wanted to learn R and to get onboarded and learn all those things you talked about, like getting it set up and what is Tidyverse like and how can we use it. So that is something that I've started to do. Uh, it's had moderate success. I probably haven't spent nearly enough time with it. And hopefully once I graduate this month, I will have a lot more time to devote to that. But it's been fun and it has had I think it's had a pretty positive response. I think at this point, academics see a lot more of the value of it than direct practice people. But I think part of it is that also the word hasn't really gotten out there yet. So I'm going to work really hard at marketing and trying to encourage more of the people that I would like to see um, in that research loop. So getting those direct practitioners involved because we need those perspectives. We need those viewpoints when we're working with clients because they work with clients day to day and they understand that perspective in the community. So that is my goal to really make them a part of the, the research process. Uh, just actually out of curiosity, what's the feedback like? What's the general first impression or like, what's it like, you know, do you, like how do they find it? Like, are they scared or intimidated or were they expecting something like this? Or maybe they've already have some experience with SPSS. What's their, what's the, what's the, 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 the first moments like uh, for the, the class? It tends to be two tracks. There are people who have had some exposure to programming languages, you know, postdocs or people in doctoral programs, and they wanna learn a little bit more and they wanna see if this is the right path for them or they use another language. Um, like maybe they were using Python and they, and they feel like R is now the way to go. And so they're a little bit more confident. 
And then there are people who have never seen any of this before. They have no idea what it's like. And so there's a little bit of trepidation and, and they're fine. They figure it out. You know, I explained to them that this is, it's a learning curve, just like everybody explained to me. There's a learning curve to it, but once you learn it, you will be fine. So just stick with it and keep practicing. So, uh, so far, so good. There, there are a couple of people who keep coming back to the classes. Hopefully they will still be there when I pick up again at the end of April or May, but they keep coming back. So I guess there's something that they feel that they're getting from it. So, yay. I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, great stuff that can be done uh, in, in that field. The general field that includes social social work, sociology, and psychology, uh, plus technology like R. I just yeah. wonder, like, if like it, 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 this is more sort of like a, a, to, something to explore. Really, is it like foundations that might spot, uh, give grants and stuff like that? Is that something that you started to look at, or is that something that's on your horizon? Let's say the Rockefeller Foundation. I don't know. I just make up names. It Bill Gates or like horizon. that. Yeah, I just need the time to do it. The capstone has been all consuming for me because in addition to being at home during lockdown with COVID, I've been a full-time caregiver to one of my parents and trying to finish my capstone. So there aren't a lot of other things I can juggle. Yeah, Funding yeah. has been kind of on the back burner. There are some very cool grants out there. I actually found some in um, NIH, which are actually for research education. Yeah. So I, I thought, wow, that's really super targeted. So <laughs> I'm hoping actually to finish one of those um, grant applications soon and just see what happens. Yeah, that, 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 that's it. it's just a sort of interesting theme that I, I think about just uh, in the general art community is like, uh, funding uh more more conversations about the seeing about uh, getting funding and so on uh like from yeah, foundations just a career path just trying to figure that out so yeah yeah um just actually sorry i was going to switch track now you know, as a sort of to the corona uh, situation so as i sort of said that we've uh, uh britain sorry uh usa and ireland are both in uh, facing the coronavirus now for about a year how has it been going for you uh, how have you coped with it and how has it affected your career and so on? It, it has been interesting. It has been a very strange year. I'm sure it has for a lot of people. As I said, um, my hospital, my organization very quickly converted to doing telehealth. Um, and I think it went pretty smoothly and we weren't losing patients. Our productivity actually went up, which is super amazing. We were able to continue to serve all of our clients. And I am super grateful for that because I really wouldn't want to lose any of them. I wouldn't want them to lose faith in us either. Um, at the same time, it's, it's odd. Depending on what your support is, um, of course, you're going to do better and, and what your personality is, you're going to do better. So I have, a, I'm a social worker and I am a therapist, so I have very good coping skills. Um, there's still been times when it's been very difficult because there, mm -hmm. there's been so much pressure from all the different responsibilities that I had. So dealing with all of that has, it, it, there have been times that it's been really rough and I'm sure that's same for everybody. So I, I have been called upon to use all the skills that I have, like mindfulness and grounding and counting, just like super basic stuff, taking the dog for walks, um, making things in the Instapot to keep myself busy. I did not learn how to bake bread. I knew how to bake bread, so I didn't have to learn how to make sourdough. But you know, just really kind of keep myself between the navigational beacons because it's just it's just so much it's so much pressure, and of course worrying about the clients as well and worrying about my parent as well because all of these are people who are negatively, I mean everybody's been negative negatively impacted by this, but they have so much more at risk, you know, because my my parent is older and they're in a high risk group, trying to keep them safe and away from people, and then worrying about patients who are isolated and really don't have the skills to reach out. Mm. And they might not have the support that they need or the skills that they need. Yeah. So um, I think that maintaining my own boundaries and trying not to take those things, you know, I have, this is my corner. This is where I do telehealth. So I think trying not to take things out of this room and into the rest of the house and into yeah, the rest yeah. of my life has been a big challenge. It's easier when you get up and you leave work. But when your commute is across the hall, it's been, it's been a lot more challenging to keep those boundaries separate. So... I think I've been fairly successful, but I really don't want to do this again. No, oh, yeah. It was pretty awful. <laughs> I like, uh, would you sort of like, so how would they, after things, hopefully, as I said, go back to normal, how would, how do you, how do you sort of uh, foresee your career 
going in the next few years, like as a social worker, but also as an R user? It, it, it's kind of an unknown because there are all sorts of interesting factors. You know, on the one hand, I've been a trauma therapist for a long time. That tends to have a limited shelf life because at some point, it, for a lot of people, I cannot speak for everybody, for a lot of people, it can, after a while, you're just kind of done because you just really... It, you just really can't do it anymore or it, you, it's really time to shift gears so you can take care of yourself mm. and I've been doing that for 10 years and so it's probably time for me to start to think about shifting gears there's also the factor that I'm uh, I'm gonna knock wood um my defense for my capstone has been scheduled at the end of the month uh, the short story is that it took me an extra year because I became a caregiver so I'm yep. hoping that I graduate with my doctorate. And I don't know if that'll change things. I think for other people it might, but I'm also not young. So <laughs> the job market can look really different. Mm. I have a feeling that what might happen, I have this theory that if people want to keep you in the box that you're in, create your own box, just create a different box. So it's possible that the project that I'm working on, if I get the right funding, can become that box and I can just get myself outside of those those limitations that other people um, might have for me and just create my own thing. And I have a feeling that's probably the direction that my career might go. Or I could go in, I, uh, right now I'm doing something that's like a hybrid of academia and um, and direct practice. And that would also be fine. So I really, I'm really not sure, but I'm sure that it will include uh, teaching R and tidyverse to as many social workers as I can. Excellent. Uh, just actually uh, go back to our ladies. Like, uh, what's the sort of uh, how 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 has your relationship or your interaction with our ladies been over the last year? I mean, it's a sort of it's obviously the whole co Corona crisis has affected how the our community self operates. Like, so what? How has that worked for you? It's been fairly limited, and that's probably my fault more than anything else. Um, just because there were only so many plates that I could spin. Yeah. And one of the things that had to go by the wayside was eventually our ladies. I was able to keep it up for a lot of the summer. And at some point I realized I just could not do one more thing. So I had to put us on hiatus. Uh, I think that when I go back to teaching social workers, like I said, at the end of April or the beginning of May, I'll probably pick up our ladies Tampa as well. Uh, but they're, they're an amazing group of people and they've yeah. always been helpful and supportive. There's, there's an our ladies Slack. And so even if I just drop in from time to time and I have a question or want to say something, they're, they're always there. They're, they're a really great organization and I can't stress enough how helpful they are to women in technology, women who want to learn these types of skills. Yeah, they, 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 they still function and exist on an online space mm -hmm. asynchronously on a permanent basis. Mm -hmm. sorry, is that 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 that's uh, uh, yep. fairly fairly clear yep. like like uh, that's great actually so uh i have one more question and i had forgotten it <laughs> sorry i tell you what we leave it there i think we really hit a lot of really good material there so i think it was just like uh that's we leave it there that's great thanks that's very good. much i'm gonna stop recording no, no. now no problem